And we continue the session with uh, Jamie Pereira. Uh, he has uh, an introduction to the session that uh, says that we are in the Anthropocene, paralyzed in our collective response to climate change, unable to move from a parasitic to a symbiotic relationship with ourselves, let alone the planet. Jamie explores data sonification as a gateway to accessing our ecological and systematic grief and deep listening as a way to radically deconstruct and redefine mental structures that have pushed us out of sync with nature. So let's welcome Jamie and you can start if you're ready. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. That's good. <clears throat> I'm just uh, what, witnessing a jumping spider slowly crawling across the front of my computer. Oh, really funny. It's, uh, almost as a cue. So, um, okay, I'm starting my time. Um, so, yeah, I um, sort of flirt around the edges of academia quite a lot um, because sonification, which I'll explain a little bit more in a bit, is um, quite multidisciplinary. Um, I find my, myself working uh, with everyone from uh, mathematicians to neuroscientists um, and I just want to stress that the opinions I have are only within the limit of my narrow experience um, and I want to note the privilege I've had to allow me to be here and so everything's a, a discussion for me <clears throat> most uh, uh, and also I'm not offering expert answers just uh, different questions uh, while I try to get a spider to not jump into the computer and um, different ways of looking at things um, and uh, usually my talks are an invitation to get past words themselves and just start listening to things uh, so within that let's see so i'm going to talk about my practice a little bit and then talk about one particular work that sonified uh, data within the anthropocene um, how that led to an awareness of ecological and systemic grief. And then a response to that uh, awareness is um, how um, hope, how the response to that, which involves, I suppose, uh, de deconstruction. I use the word decolonization because it's the nearest one to uh, what I found um, and how that changed the way I listen. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. Um, usually I conduct a sort of deep listening exercise at the end of um, uh, this talk, but um, I'll just describe it uh, this time because it doesn't necessarily work online. So um, I do sound art um, and I do talks about the sound art and I do it uh, in different places in the world. And I also do workshops uh, and it's around um, sonification um now sonification combines sound um and it uh it represents objects um now sound on its own is very emotional it doesn't transfer facts necessarily just sentiment objects are or data it's hard facts uh, but usually when they're experienced there's no emotional pull so sonification sits somewhere in between it's not quite music it's not quite information but it conveys both emotion and facts simultaneously and that can be useful um, i'm still uh finding the results of um doing performances of sonifications it has a different effect every single time i i, I do I, I do something um but in general um creating a factual yet emotional forum can be fun or important in putting a, a point across and um I started off by doing things like this. Just um, 
taking the height and depth of people and deciding velocity and uh, pitch. And just experiments, really. And um, things got more long form as I started to get commissions um, and also more tied to social issues, mainly because these were things I was interested in and sonifying things means an investigation into the objects themselves. Um, here's a sonification of the level of Trump's lies as he exits the Paris Climate Accord. And there were sort of like liar meters, you know, about the level of untruths that because it was quite a highly publicized um, happening. Before we discuss the uh, Paris Accord, I'd like to begin with an update on our tremendous, absolutely tremendous economic progress since Election Day on November 8th. The economy is starting to come back and very, very rapidly. So, I and mean, it's very coincidental that it makes him sound like an idiot. Um, and his um, uh, taking fossil fuel data, this is kind of like a gateway into uh, a big climate piece that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is turning uh, global fossil fuel extraction into a performance for three cellos. Okay, that's it. <clears throat> and finally, I think finally, um, this was a sonification of deaths from the first wave of coronavirus in the UK. Uh, this wasn't something I did lightly, but now it serves as a kind of audio documentary of Struggling. experiences at that time. Um, and then being completely helpless in my role, so I guess we've had to <laughs> find um, other ways of supporting. So, I, you know, I never get forward. I we were on the ward helping to do. Uh, at the moment. So those little sounds that you're hearing in the background is a sort of a, a, a record of uh, deaths as they happened by day. Um, so you start to see a link between representing data with objects and by doing so uh, shedding light on the issues behind them. So everything, so for example, uh, with climate change, I uh, became aware of uh, ecological and systemic grief. Um, I did a, a, a sonification of Twitter uh, for COP26 last year, it was, and that uh, informed me about marginalised groups and resilience projects around the world, um, coronavirus. Uh, for me, it was government ineptitude and the human spirit. Uh, I did a piece on protests, uh, which showed me really interesting um, movements in uh, how, what our moral bedrock is. Data privacy, we're mind we don't care, mathematical proofs, maths can actually have a story. Um, uh, and what I'd like to talk about is my journey uh, through this piece, which is Anthropocene in C major, uh, which takes us on a data journey through the Holocene, which is about 12,000 years worth of um, uh, Earth system trends and socioeconomic um, data, all global. Um, so I'd like to share with you the process by which I became aware of ecological and systemic grief, how I moved from there to a space of awareness and uh, decolonization, that's a key word, and then how I think um, when applying this to sound, it can help us with our shared uh, crisis. So I'll just play a quick snippet. This is where CO2 and sea level get joined by surface temperature and population growth data. So you can see the two bands on the screen. Um, there's a double bass playing CO2. And um, that superimposed image is actually megafauna extinction. So we're at the beginning of the Holocene about uh, 10, 12, 12 that's And um, the was quite low, but there was a sea level sample playing there. 
So that, that's, um, uh, you can see this in this performance guide. Um, well, there's lots to see. There's the orchestral instruments and data and sound sources and data that they represent on the left. And then you can start seeing the beginning of a graph. And where we were was um, those first two data threads being joined by the red one and the blue one. Um, and as we go through, uh, there's some things to point out. Uh, first of all, the data starts getting more and more complicated as we hit the present day. And then looking at the time frame, I slow down dramatically when we reach 1700 and again when we reach 1900 and once more when we reach um, the year 2000. So I acknowledge my agency as a composer uh, and the flaws in the sonification. Um, if I had uh, made time a constant, it would have led to an impossibly long performance, like you know, at least like 10 hours long. Um, and so in spite of this um, stuff, and, and also it's not, it's not the sound of the Anthropocene, it's not the sound of climate change, it's a performance based on anthropogenic data trends. You know? So um, it's a transformation that hopefully allows perspective shift, um, but it's nothing without being a gateway to exploring an issue, um, uh, be it climate change, coronavirus response, etc. Um, one thing sonification allows us to do is experience data in a way that would be quite impenetrable uh, visually. Although I've had a good attempt at it here, um, and uh, this is why I feel like it's um, uh, it's always interesting when I play this piece live because I'm sharing sharing this experience um, with people. So working with anthropogenic data trends, it becomes clear that. Uh, you know, you just become aware of a few things, you know, uh, first thing is we, we happen to be quite lucky. It's quite, um, um, what's the word, ironic that um, we are messing up our environment as much as we are because we happen to be in a relatively stable epoch compared to the period before it, the, the last glacial period or the last ice age. And then <clears throat> in a relatively tiny amount of time, uh, epoch-wise, around 600 or 700 years, a series of events have happened that have pushed us as a species into an adversarial relationship with the natural systems that sustain us. Uh, in, in this piece, I've sonified the creation of things like ownership, money, hoarding, exploitation, slavery, extraction, and the movement to firstly a colonial and now neo-colonial explosion that forms our present. Um, and my understanding is, uh, based on this experience of the data, is that to resync with the planet and our own human altruism, we need to flatten the curve of this neo-colonial trajectory and counter its perpetuated myths. Um, we know now we are in the presence of myths. That's uh, David Graeber and David Wengro on the uh, what's it, the conventional account of human history as just a saga of material progress. So seeing through these myths was a process of connecting to ecological and systemic grief, viscerally rejecting, um, I had a process of uh, viscerally rejecting my conditioning and then starting a journey of radical deconstruction and decolonization. So what is ecological grief? Well, it could also be called climate anxiety, climate panic, uh, that depends on your privilege and how close you are to the forefront of climate change. Also, there's the word solastalgia that describes a form of emotional or um, existential stress caused by environmental change, but we're going to stick with ecological grief for now. Um, ecology comes from the word oikos in Greek, meaning home. So when we say ecological grief, we're grieving for our home. And systemic grief is grief regarding the structures we live in that have enabled climate change to happen. So if climate change is the symptom, then systemic issues are the cause. What is revealed is that whether we see it or not, we are all somewhere in the stages of grief with inexorable links to this consistent inherited systemic trauma. You know? We are constantly moving between denial, depression, anger, pain, all of these um, traits of uh, the grieving process, and also turning points, reconstruction and hope. But some of you might have heard uh, climate change being described as a hyper object. Um, the, 
the properties of climate change aren't linear, so it's not an easy grief to be aware of. It's not like the death of a loved one, because uh, that's relatively linear. There will be a, uh, a sort of uh, a pathway through and possibly an end point to the grieving. With climate change and the system that caused it, it's um, all encompassing uh, and ever present, and yet it's hard to see exactly what we're grieving for. It's like grieving for someone that's always dying, invisible, and yet all around us. But the positive is that um, one, as soon as one becomes truly aware of their own ecological and systemic grief, it's a catalyst for constructed hope. Um, because the more you notice the systemic issues that are causing climate change, the more you can make decisions that inform pro a process of deconstruction and redefinition of the self and one's surroundings. What we're seeing in the world around us with climate change, all of this um, paralysis and non-action is um, largely unconditioned, uh, sorry, l largely unconscious and a conditioned response. So where we need to be is in a place where we're able to continue to question things or challenge the bedrock of everything we know. And in doing so, we give ourselves agency. Every uh, creative response that you make when you are aware that these things are affecting you um, turns into an act of learning, resilience, self-discovery, and critical reflection. Climate change has given us for the first time a unified global message. If we want to save life as we know it on Earth, we need to free ourselves from our current systemic ideology, critique positions of power and dominant culture, and manifest structural change that creates reparations for centuries of systemic injustice. You could call this activism, you could call this emancipation, but there's one word which has been used more and more um, to describe this need to change, and that's how I arrived at the word decolonization. So what do I mean by this? Well, it's the, uh, the undoing, just literally the undoing of uh, colonialism and neocolonialism. Uh, the actual doing of that is a, a bit more complicated, um, but it manifests in an ongoing critique of Western worldview, challenging norms that stem from impositions of religion, language, economics and culture, and then uplifting indigenous knowledge, but obviously not co-opting it. Um, and I put at the, put the end this um, challenge to the idea, I am greater than you, you are less than me, which comes from the story of Emu, uh, the world's original malignant narcissist. Uh, this is from Tyson Young Porter, who writes, Emu is a troublemaker who brings into being the most destructive idea in existence. I am greater than you, you are less than me. And this is the source of all human misery. Aboriginal society was designed over thousands of years to deal with this problem. Some people are just idiots and everybody has a bit of idiot in them from time to time. Uh, it comes from some deep place inside that whispers, you are special, you are greater than other things and people, you are more important than everything and everyone. All things and all people exist to serve you. This behaviour needs massive checks and balances to contain the damage, the damage it can do. So finally, just to note that it's important to acknowledge the specificity of what decolonization means uh, being different depending on who and where you are. Um, I've uh, like, for example, doing a talk um, about decolonization here is very different from uh, a talk that I did recently in Australia. For First Nation peoples, it's uh, specifically the return of stolen lands and the dismantling of um, colonial infrastructure. And um, this is the goal for Second Nation peoples too, which is mostly um, us. Um, but there are also steps to getting there. We need to become aware of uh, what's happening in terms of the extent of our colonization. And it's, a, it's important not just to rely on uh, notions to decolonize your mind, thinking or knowledge, um, because that's just colonizing the words. It's not really doing anything. The end goal is to act, which means chaining, changing things for the sake of our collective ecology. So what are the things that we need to question? Well, this is where it gets interesting. So for example, it might be that everyone recognizes the need for academia 
to decolonize its methodologies in order to become more empathetic to people and planet. Um, but then have you considered that the words I'm using to do this talk are of a language that has suffocated other languages that treat objects differently and that this has had an effect on most Second Nations uh, people's very perception of reality? And I'll touch on that more at the end. But the point is that our conditioning is much deeper than we think. And we must learn to, to critique this conditioning, even as we perpetuate it in the systems that we are forced to inhabit. In essence, we must learn to be, uh, to, or to become self-aware hypocrites. And when we cannot rely on neo-colonial modes of learning, where do we turn? So for me, it's three sources that are clearly emerging. Um, one is youth. Um, I'm, I'm 44 now, so I'm, uh, I think I'm borderline old, you know, um, but more and more I'm seeing that the youth have a raw truth that doesn't care for existing structures. Um, next, it would be marginalized. Um, for example, um, the LGBTQ plus communities know more about joyfully deconstructing false binaries than anyone else. And marginalized communities at, at the forefront of climate change leading the way in showing us how to recognize the signs of a rapidly changing environment and how to adapt at a ground level. Uh, for example, uh, flooded areas of Bangladesh, there are uh, the most um, uh, marginalized communities developing climate resistant farming techniques. And lastly, and mostly most important is uh, our indigenous uh, who have knowledge and templates of living that challenge systemic preconceptions of what of things that we're not even aware of. So um, before I talk about how this um, uh, changed how I listen, um, it's just this is a really call to, to ask questions and, um, and listen to things that, that we might not be uh, subjected to uh, in the normal sort of pathway of our lives. Um, it's a call to decolonize our methodology so that we return not just to a hum humanistic way of thinking, but one that supports our collective ecology. So there's been a number of ways this has influenced the way I listen. Um, and I suppose if I can have these revelations, it's an inspiration to explore how um, this process can influence your practices. Um, so, as I said, usually when I'm in a space physically, I do this at a, a, a meditative deep listening exercise, but today I'll just describe it uh, and its origins. So there's a book called um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I recommend, um, and in it, Robin Wall Kamira, the author, describes how she was struggling to learn her native Potawatomi language, uh, which is hard, but she felt um, a need to um, learn it because there were only about eight people um, uh, of, of her First Nations community that spoke it, but it was impossible. It was full of verbs covering objects when she felt they shouldn't. So one example was the word Saturday. She looked at it and said, well, how on earth is it possible to be a Saturday? And um, she was about to, to give up, like throwing the book down and feeling her ancestors um, sigh in the background when she saw the word um, wikwagama, which means bay, be a bay. And suddenly she felt her synapses firing and could smell the water of their bay, watch it rock against the shore and hear it move onto the sands. And this is a, an example of the way Potawatomi sees objects as if they're living. Now, now, I was on the beach, like coincidentally, when I read this, and it felt for me like it was the first time that I really wanted to live, like not be other to something um, and not be in this kind of almost parasitic relationship with my environment, but suddenly part of it. And when we listen with ears that are part of the thing they're listening to, it's an invitation to move to a level where we exist without division. And by this, I mean, there's no difference between us and nature, there's no difference between me and you. Um, there's a, 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 a deconstruction of binaries themselves. Um, and in certain sounds, we find that there's a voice that doesn't use words. You can hear it in, for example, the sea uh, or the wind in the trees uh, or a morning bird song. 
we've been responding to this voice for many millennia, uh, way past um, uh, the time when uh, colonialism happened. And that's our true relationship with nature and each other. And also it feels really good. So if we allow this space to be our vanguard, we find that we can start to question and redefine the mental structures that are separating us from our environment. So if we can get this from just one challenge to our perception from indigenous knowledge, then I'm truly excited to see where this leads and how it affects my practice. And um, I hope this has resonated with you and your practices. So thank you very much. And these are some of the references, some of which I'm still reading that have guided this talk. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. It was a beautiful presentation. It resonated a lot, I'm sure, with lots of members here in the audience and with me in particular. Um, so I don't know if anyone has some question or wants to ask Jamie something. It's, it's highly fascinating that you are developing works, aesthetic works, that try to change the mentality on a sub-level, subconscious level, and try to highlight uh, modes of doing that through deep listening or other techniques. I'm sure lots of artists here and other researchers share this kind of uh, need to face these troubling times and tack how to tackle the the collapse of this anthropocenic scenario. So, thank you again for the beautiful presentation. And so, if there are no more questions, okay, there is there is a couple of questions. Wait, just a second. Thanks. It was uh, amazing this presentation, and I I think it's really interesting this idea of decolonizing through hearing because uh, somehow the like vision has been uh, the, the figurative uh, paradigm of, of also um, a form of domination uh, just a, just a comment at some point you were mentioning uh, the Renaissance but I think this is also um, co col colonized you know a, a colonizing force rather than not. Uh, even though, in a sense, you could imagine, uh, you know, colonization per se, as we mean it, as uh, uh, coming after, uh, it is still, uh, it is already a form of uh, colonization of uh, the West from even, you know, before and the Roman Empire. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, Imagine to go, you know, thinking of going back to pre-colonization. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, referring to the to the Renaissance. I, I wouldn't do that. But the idea of sound uh, instead of uh, vision is really uh, key, I believe, in uh, in redefining um, uh, some form of relation to knowledge. Also, in in many different cultures, where. Uh, uh, or, or a, a lot of um, even India, Indian applied philosophy, where where uh, um, philosophy is not just reasoning, dialectic, but it's a practice of uh, of reconnection, and that's what you were saying with language as well, and reconnecting to other ways of seeing the real that is embedded in language is uh, quite illuminating. So thank you. It was just a comment, not really a question. Um, yeah, well, I can comment on your comment. Um, the, <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it, it goes from sort of um, uh, like a, a, a researching or, or taking a dive into um, type periods like the Renaissance and um, uh, the Enlightenment and the Age of Discovery to try and figure out what the the cause of our you know our, our our current relationship with the climate 
climate was. Um, it goes from that to uh, actively challenging things that we would otherwise hold as sacred, like um, our understanding of words, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, and, and most of what I'm learning has come from uh, just a few books and then just lots of conversations with different people as I go and perform things. Um, but it's, um, um, it, 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 it's ongoing, you know, and I, I totally agree with you about sound um, as uh, an alternative um, to a highly uh, visualized culture. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily be, well, I can, t I can tell you why from my perspective, it's just that you, it's, it's sort of softer and it conveys information in a way that isn't otherizing. Um, and I'm not too sure what I mean by that <laughs> either, but um, it's, um, yeah, it's something that I'm actively investigating, but, but also hoping to show people in terms of doing these listening exercises. So yeah, like I said, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm, uh, there was a bit of confusion because I think Adri Adrienne, um, who might be there, was thinking I was going to be there in person. But if I am ever doing something like this again in person, I'd love to conduct that exercise um, because it, it really does <clears throat> take away from words themselves and the emphasis that we place on them um, and moves us into a realm where it's just about listening in a, in a deconstructed way. Hello, yes, I'm here. <laughs> yes, and I do have a question, but since it is a, a, a broad question that I think concerns all the presentations, uh, I would like to leave it for after the next round table. So please stay with us because I will be very interested in uh, hearing you all <laughs> uh, responding and interacting. <laughs> so, but uh, I will just send a seed now. So uh, I'm very interested, uh, I will be very interested, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, in hearing from you all and also from the two people that are still going to talk. Um, how do you, um, whether and how do you uh, sense this, um, this relationship uh, between science and art, uh, this uh, representing something, uh, and then at the same time uh, actually doing, and this is in my opinion a characteristic of art, just um, uh, uh, a work that uh, is only intended for experience itself, I mean, which uh, whose value is uh, on its own, in itself. So this uh, false dichotomy between uh, raising awareness that you were talking about and um, sonifying phenomena that we should be aware of, right? Um, how do you actually uh, establish constraints so that the outcome is interesting in, uh, on its own in perceptual terms and to which extent is it actually important that, um, that uh, people understand what the sounds are representing? So I know, of course, that for Philippe, that's the whole point of his field of research, it's all about that. Uh, but then again, these, this uh, model of visualization is so striking and, and strong on its own. And I suppose he could have chosen uh, a less beautiful model. So I will be interested in having you debating about that. 